Todd Cashton, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. It's so good to be here. Yeah, I am really excited. I, I saw um, the, the, your new book, The Art of Insubordination, uh, mentioned on a Facebook post by Russ Harris, whom I, I, I follow, and I just, immediate, like, I just immediately got it because of, because of Russ and because of the title. So, um, and I know my, a lot of my listeners are very passionate about lots of causes and most of us do it poorly. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really, very, yeah. In fact, the, the more, the more passionate we are, I think the worse we, we tend to do. Yeah. There's, there's this, this interesting ideological blindness we have where if we are hyper-focused on one cause, we tend to, to kind of really sift the evidence except the same have different standards for the evidence that supports us. And we kind of are really good at using our critical thinking skills to dismiss all the other information out there. Yeah. So before we talk about the book, we have to, we have to bond about action park. <laughs> so oh, you, do, oh, wait, where, where are your scars on your body? <laughs> they're, they're all psychological. No, I, I, I knocked myself out at action park on a trampoline. We, which which ride was the trampoline? I don't was, remember that it was, one. It was. I wasn't going on any of the water rides. It was. Just, they just had like places where you could like just these these bouncy trampolines, and there was like too many people on them. Oh, so yeah. what did what did your um what did your chin hit? Another my, person. My, my knee. Oh, ow. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, I have permanent scars on my legs from the Alpine slide where if your listeners have never been to the most dangerous ac adventure park in the 1980s, um, you're basically going down a go-kart with no engine and just a single joystick down asphalt. And the asphalt is about 115 yards and it's got hairpin turns. And so basically about 60% of people fly off of the asphalt and it's the rocks aren't cleared away between the lanes of asphalt. So when you fall off the side of this alpine slide, you're basically hitting rocks. And there are a couple of people that were unconscious. And I think there's at least one person died from a brain hemorrhage. And they, this is before, this is before, um, you know, America was a litigious society. So kids would just walk away with blood dripping down their face and their legs. And the thing was in the eighties, you just, you love the fact that you had autonomy as an 11 year old. And it was a dream that no adults told you, you couldn't do or say anything. Yeah. No, it's, <laughs> it was an amazing place. And I, and I, you, you mentioned, you know, you can Google it and there's a, you know, Seth Porges played this incredible documentary um just about a, a different time right? um how old were you when you went there i was a teenager so i think i might have been like 19 or 20 maybe i think i, I was actually okay. I, was, I was leading a youth group so i was uh I, I i was a young judea leader in college and so we took a trip there in like the, the let's say like late 80s mid 80s and then how did everyone fare in terms of the parents you, the parents being handed back a bunch of kids with band-aids and, yeah. et, and you know eternal scars in their bodies. Yeah, yeah, I don't remember. So it, it either was terrible or it wasn't, and I've I've either repressed it or I haven't. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> but so, somehow this is a metaphor for uh, for life, right? Oh, it's. I mean, it is an exemplar. If I was writing a parenting book, I would use Action Park as an exemplar of supporting your kids' autonomy, treating them that they're more intelligent than you think they are, and recognizing that they have to have accidents and it hurts to see it. So don't go to Action Park with them. Um, be there to welcome them back with a nice hug and some ice cream afterwards. Because if you were to watch what happened to those kids that are jumping off 60-foot cliffs and doing motorboats where the grease would drip out into the water and you could smash your motorboat into other kids' motorboats, you would never let your kids ever go into that park. Right. In fact, the the thing I did as a teenager when I was uh, the summer I turned fifteen, I went on a teen tour from this company that's now they're now out of business, um, and it was unbelievably wild. Like from the you know the sexual exploration that like you know these are kids like from like fourteen to to nineteen, which is a pretty wide age range, 
to yeah. to the crazy things they let us do. Um, and I've got to say, you know, I have a couple of friends who are still from from that tour. It was like the best experience of our lives, and and it was terrifying at the time. You know, what was what was the terrifying part? So I remember us jumping off a bridge, like just like we like the bus went over a bridge, and the leader said, "Hey, let's just jump off. Let's like that looks like fun. Like I don't even know if the first person knew how deep the water was in the river below. Um, we would do these you know these slides, sort of like alpine, but they were like on the side of the highway, like like sluices for 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 water runoff, just like with you know concrete sides, and we'd all go down that. We'd all end up with you know needing betadine on our wounds. Um, just let they let us off in um, like Los Angeles and said like meet back at the bus in in nine hours. <laughs> just so the beauty the, the beauty of that story is you need to have we need to allow the individual differences is that society would not function. No group would function. If you had all introverts or all extroverts, you need the risk takers that are ones, the first ones to jump off the bridge. Um, I personally always tell my daughters go third. The first person might've been lucky. The second person starts to create a trend. And then you can see whether there's a large rock underneath the water that you can't see from the surface. <laughs> um, but you need a combination of both. No group is going to survive if you don't have risk takers and cautious calculated characters that are working together right and that, de that definitely segues into the art of insubordination which one of the the most challenging things is to ally ally align yourself with people who are very different from you right like that's i think that's like one of, when i was reading through all the different points like that seems to be the hardest thing to understand that the, that there's diversity and inclusion that needs to happen for any movement to get off the ground. Yeah. Every day has a different story that you can give about this, about that this is one of the, the lingering prejudices in society. It doesn't matter what country you're in is people that don't think like you, you don't want to be around them because they don't, they don't give you a sufficient reinforcement when you can be around people that validate you and tell you how smart you are and finish your sentences. Um, but you know, one of the things that the science tells us is that our ideas have to be stress tested, especially if it's going to relate to our performance, our functioning at home, our functioning, our relationships, our functioning of developing our self and identity is if we're around people that disagree with us, the worst case scenario is we have to sharpen our arguments and we lose the argument that time. And the best case scenario is we develop more knowledge and wisdom and we have a little bit more uncertainty and doubt and even better. We might've changed our mind and realized that maybe we were too extremist or maybe, maybe we were too moderate in our thinking and that we need to be more extreme. You know, one of the, one of the big fault lines in conflict management is the belief that there's some middle ground defined between two people. And you forget that sometimes you should both be closer to the margins. Mm -hmm. And the only way that we can test the quality of ideas is to actually work with those, those ideas with someone that has some semblance of skepticism plus good faith plus intellectual humility where they believe they can actually require information outside of just them to understand themselves, the world, and other people. Mm -hmm. And I love you have so many great examples and um, like giving people phraseology for how – like it doesn't take two people to – to start that process. Like if you're a person of goodwill, I love, I, I, you have a, something about, um, you know, the goal of conversation is learning, not persuading, right? Like if, if I, if someone is trying to persuade me and I just go into learning mode instead of defending myself against their persuasion, they'll come around. They'll, they'll get more curious too, won't they? Yeah, this is from uh, my colleague, Francesca Gino at Harvard. And, you know, we had a, I had a class in my science of well-being course yesterday where we were talking about one of the biases that society doesn't spend enough time talking about is physical attractiveness. Mm -hmm. And one thing we know is that when we see beautiful people or even beautiful animals, deer, cats, dogs, that we impugn 
the rest of the world compared to them and view the beautiful people that they're also morally righteous, they're ethical, they're good thinkers, they're good listeners. And we, we have this halo effect around beautiful people. And this has implications for hiring people, admissions, first interactions, first dates. And just because you're physically attractive, there's no correlation that you have a good ratio of, you know, the width of your eyes and the the length of space between your nose and your upper lip, that ratio, which is relevant to beauty, that that has any correlation with intelligence or creativity or wisdom. But we have to understand, you have to understand the bias in order to work through the bias. And I can tell you that this class yesterday, it was uproarious. There was so much discontent with the notion that we should even be talking about attractive people mm -hmm. that I was actually dumbfounded of, of, and I just kind of pointed out regularly of this is why we have to talk about it is we're so uncomfortable acknowledging that not everyone is equal in physical attractiveness. And yes, there are individual differences in what we find attractive, but we kind of know that Jared Leto is a really extremely good looking guy and Beyonce is a really extremely good looking woman. And we have these cultural factors but we, we can acknowledge beauty when we see it, even if that's not for us. But if we don't address and acknowledge and talk about biases, then we can't alter the systems. And that's what this book's about. This, about, this book's about altering dysfunctional norms and systems. Yeah. But I, I want to get into the book, but back to this. Like, I've never talked about physical attractiveness in that way. And it's, it's so obvious, but it's almost like it's harder to talk about that than to talk about, say, racial bias. Because like people are very clear what race they are, right? Right. But but like we're talking point. about physical attractiveness, and then I have to say, well, you know, Todd, as a extremely physically attractive man with a very bald, like I, you know, I I'm awkward, like even wondering where I am on that scale, like let let alone being able to talk about it usefully. Yeah. So there's so Howie, you bring up a really good point, which is it's a good question of who can you address phys the physical attractiveness of the person? So you talking about yourself is going to be problematic. You talking directly to the person where you're evaluating them is problematic. But you talking about that there is something there, this proxy variable that we're using for something other than physical attractiveness to judge someone. So we're judging someone better or worse because of their physical attractiveness. That's something that I think that we should actually have a conversation about. And I know it's uncomfortable for organizations, especially in the business world, especially, you know, in the educational world. But again, I, I have this belief that the only dangerous thoughts are the ones that we're not allowed to speak out loud. And then they become dangerous because they fester and and kind of weaken the floorboards of society and we don't even know it's happening. And I, what I want to live in is a society where someone can be a three and a two on a 10 point scale of physical attractiveness and feel pretty damn confident that it has been taken into consideration that that will not be used against them versus to live in a society where we can't address that conversation. Right. So of a Stephen Hawking world. Yeah, yeah, right. It's and and Stephen Hawking, you know, he was comfortable talking about anything. There's something about the neurodiversity. This is one of the strengths getting back to the diversity issue. With neurodiversity is that these individuals, they are more pragmatic in their thinking, especially in, when you're in the higher end of, you know, the autism spectrum. And the rest of the world really thinks very carefully about likability and social attractiveness. And so when these worlds meet, it's very challenging conversations for both those worlds. And I just don't think we're having enough sophisticated conversations about this, of someone that believes really strongly in William James' ethical concept of pragmatism, which is what what is the behavior to choose now that will actually be functionally work towards the outcome we desire? Like what will lead to the smartest person to be hired in a, with the applicants that we have versus an egalitarian person who believes that we have to think very carefully about um, the feelings, the thoughts, and the backgrounds of individuals, even though they may not be relevant directly to the work that we want to hire someone for. So those two people, neither one's wrong, but they're two philosophical frameworks. Mm -hmm. And as for the how, you know, we can get into the, some of strategies, but there's there's no clear algorithm of how to get those two groups of people together 
to talk to each other on a hiring committee. Right. Funny. I just I had I just had a conversation with a friend of mine who's written a book on entrepreneurship, and he was sharing research on the makeup of successful and unsuccessful teams. And it it turns out that the the more diversity and inclusion of diversity there is in t- in these teams, the more likely they are to come up with uh, with you know projects and uh, organizations that that succeed. So I think that may, maybe there's a way to square those uh, the pragmatism versus egalitarianism to when we when we actually put it into practice that uh, they, they might be one and the same in certain cases. Well, it's. You know, if you look at the data and their meta-analyses, it's not that impressive about demographic and functional diversity improving the performance of groups as a main effect, right? So just just a singular thing, if we increase the ratio of men and women in a group, if we increase the racial, the racial demographics of a group, it's not impressive in terms of predicting better performance by the group or more creativity that happens there. There are other variables that have to be at play to unlock the potential of diversity. And you know, one of those things is, is do we extract the unique information from those diverse individuals? Do we have a sufficient pool of people that are going to dissent from the status quo to actually bring creative ideas into the room. But it's not, you know, we treat it as a, a simplistic main effect problem. Increased diversity, thumbs up, good things are going to happen. And and one of the things that I really wanted to spend six years on is, well, what are the mechanisms that, that synergize the presence of diversity so good things happen versus bad things? Because we know that when you bring a diverse group in, there's a trade-off. One of the things that disappears is locomotion which is the scientific term for the speed to which you are able to make decisions Mm -hmm. and actually meet your goals that goes down. So, and we should be talking about that because if we want to actually, if we do believe that we should increase diversity, we have to be honest that it's not clear cut. It's not all positive outcomes across the board. What trade-offs are you willing to absorb to, and what's the exact outcomes that you want to obtain? Mm. Complicated stuff. I can see why it takes taking you six years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's why what's why I like you know meeting with you and hanging out here is that I want to have these conversations so that other people can replicate them in their small groups. Right. So I do I do want to make sure we get into the the book because it's so good. Um, Thank you. And so the first thing I love is that you start by telling a story that I've known my whole life and never at- attached any significance to, which is Rick Barry's underhand free throws. <laughs> so how, how did that come to, first of all, you know, how did that come to you as sort of a, an organizing metaphor for resistance to positive change? And um, you know, maybe tell us the story as well. Yeah, well, I, I think the personal backdrop is a little more interesting is um, I, so I don't know if we have a video for this podcast, but I look like an athlete, but I have no athletic potential whatsoever. And I know this because I'm a 47 year old man and I made it through all of those grade school years with only a moderate amount of bullying. And I was regularly picked first for basketball games, for baseball games, for football games. Cause I've genetically, I just look like an athlete. How tall are you? And then this 5'10", 180, but, you know, like I can bench press a lot and I can uh-huh. kind of lift a lot of throw, – throw big heavy things around. Okay. And so when you had the second game of basketball, I was always picked last or second to last because they realized, oh, that's a false positive, <laughs> picking Todd for your team. Like that's – that is not a good idea. And then this is, this is, this is much of my, my life. And so I tried a whole bunch of sports, um, sucked at baseball, sucked at basketball – sucked at football, sucked at lacrosse. And finally, I found one sport where I was really, I could really throw myself into. And that was the shot put for track and field, because all you did was throw a big, huge 16 pound metal orb as far as possible. But it's been around for 2000 years. Just we don't have any fans because it's (laughs) for the outsider. It's a pretty boring biomechanical engineered task. Um, And when I tried to play basketball without having a dad growing up, I started throwing underhand because it's just a natural thing that kids do. They pick up a ball. Just watch any kid when you get off this, listening to this podcast, 
they throw they don't throw overhand because it's such a complicated physical maneuver in terms of balancing your two hands the physics in terms of the speed and trajectory and the angle that you have to throw the ball underhand it goes in a complete nice ellipsis up slowly and then hits the rim and it has a chance to bounce around a little bit it has a a greater chance of you know going through the net that happens there and so watching it with myself watching it with my three daughters I just realized that here you have a very functional strategy that will lead you to get the ball into the net far more often often than throwing it overhand, and yet nobody does it. And there's all these professional athletes that are on record who would say that I throw better underhand. Statistically, like it's proven, and I won't do it because I don't want to be seen as a wuss, a sissy excuse my language. I don't want to be seen as a girl. And so these are the words that professional athletes use. They hired trainers to make them better. These trainers made them better. And if professional athletes who are paid to win games, get points and have fans love them because they score a lot and they impress them by getting the ball in the net, if they're too afraid of doing it because of the fear of negative valuation, what a great indicator of how hard it is to deviate from what societal societal scripts say is the proper way to behave or deviant or different ways of behaving. Mm. Yeah, like it's, it was, and, and then you have stories like, you know, Will Chamberlain tried it for a while and improved his performance. And <clears throat> like there was, I was like tr- trying to figure out to put myself in the shoes of the professional athletes. Like what were the sort of in the moment vectors that were pushing them either towards or against. And it was it was like a little mystifying. So I've been watching, since I read that, I've been watching some games and I've been watching some, I, I've been watching the, um, I don't know if you've seen the, the HBO Max series about the Lakers winning time. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just watching these guys and I'm just, I, I, I'm yelling at them in your voice. <laughs> like, be a deviant, shoot, <laughs> shoot underhand. You could You could change history. Because many games are won or lost by two or three points. And so if someone misses seven shots, but actually, I lo- Howie, I like the way that you're going with this, because one thing that I, I haven't spent much time about on this topic is what what was in the column for the benefit of changing and continuing to shoot underhand? Like, what, like to what degree were they able to recognize the rewards? To what degree were people telling them the incentives of, hey, listen, if you're the scoring champion or in the top 10 of scoring, this year, you're going to get a hundred thousand dollar bonus. So, there there were financial incentives there, and were they encouraged? Were they discouraged? D- did the manager, did the did the, the general manager of the organization, did their agent actually tell them, listen, it's more important to have social approval in the moment rather than playing the long game? Because this, this is one of the things about about rebellions and about being progressive and trying to you know pursue a movement. Can you absorb the friction and social persecution in the short term because you understand the prize, the long game? You know, in this case, it's kind of it's not really that much of of a societally important good, but winning points and winning games. That's what that's what's there for an athlete. But the analog is if you're trying to uh, reduce reduce the degree to which animals are slaughtered in a way that has unnecessary pain for us to have hamburgers and hot dogs and I guess chicken McNuggets aren't real food, then in this case, the outcome is a little bit more powerful, which is how do we reduce the amount of suffering towards animals in terms of how we treat them? And how should we think about being a meat eater versus a vegetarian? So with that outcome, what short-term pain are individuals, are food companies, are you know, shopping centers able to absorb for the long-term gain of having a society with less pain and less suffering. Yeah. And so, so you know, the, the chapter two on system, we talk a lot about system justification theory and like that kind of blew my mind. It'd be partly because it was all new to me and partly because it was not new to me, right? Like the idea that you know, this sort of like, what's the, the the problem with Kansas or why do people vote against their self-interests or why do Mexican-Americans uh, approve of Trump in the numbers, which they do, like things that I look at and I say, well, that makes no sense. And yet, like, it's complex. 
right? Like why, why we re resist things that, why people resist things that to me is obvious it would make their lives better to embrace. Yeah, this is, it's, to me, the perplexing part is how often psychology is not brought into the picture as people try to make sense of this. Politicians and pundits um, are trying to say, you know, why is it that people who are in um, lower income areas in the middle of the United States voting for government officials that are actually costing them money and costing them health care? And these are people, there's, you know, there are extremely high rates of, of you know, obesity and diabetes and, you know, opioid addictions in some of these same counties. And they're voting for the exact government official that will not support them and helping them on those issues that will increase their health, their vitality, their happiness, and their longevity. And it's, it's just amazing how much group dynamics helps us understand how people make these decisions. You know, the issue of yesterday was mass mandates on airlines being changed as people were in the mid flight <laughs> and pilots were saying, listen, it was just changed. Um, we are, we are, you know, hour one into traveling cross country. So if you can choose to take off your mask or not. And what was interesting about this was watching the responses um, in the news and people personally who are on these flights and it broke down into political groups and you could, you know, you can guess people's responses, but I watch in the field of psychology where almost all of my colleagues are bemoaning the fact that this mass mandate was removed and nobody's talking about scientific evidence. Nobody's talking about the, you know, center for disease control. Nobody's talking about um, the changes in, in the trajectory of COVID and, and COVID diagnoses, but also illness, injury, and death. They're just relating to what the group says they should be saying and what the group's norms tends to be. And that's interesting that if scientists who are obsessed with evidence go down this rabbit hole, we can't expect anything anything more from the layperson who is just trying to understand how to put food on their table and make sure that their kids get to soccer practice on time. Yeah. And, and you know, one of the things you point out is that the more – stress someone is under or the more oppressed a group is the more vulnerable they feel um the more likely they are to support the very system that's oppressing them uh, right and that makes sense i mean how you and i can think about when when have we had a very high allostatic load where we were so over overburdened with maybe a physical injury or relationship problems that we we wrote we wrote worse. We had you know we had our IQ dropped by twenty points because we couldn't function well. Um, this is what happens. We know this. You know, Roy Baumeister has this great body of work showing that when people are momentarily induced to feeling a state of loneliness or disconnection from a group, that they actually show a drop in intellectual functioning and they they make worse decisions. And compared to when they're not in those states. And so this intellectual drop, it's not permanent. It's a momentary thing that happens when we're stressed. And I think it's another vantage point of thinking about marginalized individuals in society. Um, are we evaluating them, assessing them for, for jobs and for making decisions about mortgages and for making decisions about their health care when they're in a situation where their allostatic load is too high? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... And like part of me was as as I'm reading the book, you know, I feel like I'm getting sort of hints as to your um, you know views on life. Like this is a you know it's a manual that you could use for sort of changing in lots of different ways. But I feel like we're very kind of similar and sort of progressive views of of things. And I, I started feeling more and more that there is something about our society that is like very happily creating this allostatic load to kind of keep people sort of consumer conformist as opposed to, you know, the kind of, of proactive activists that we would theoretically want in the society to keep looking for, hey, how can we make things better? It's almost like whether it's a conspiracy or just a systematic outcome, that most people are too busy and, and sort of polyvagally 
um, you know, overwrought to try to change anything in the system. Yeah, I mean, one thing I think about having twin 15-year-old daughters and a nine-year-old daughter is here's a generation that's going to be digital natives. They didn't know anything that was pre-internet. And you have, and they've embraced full-heartedly um, for all sorts of reasons, you know, the, interacting online. And you could not have a more stressful environment than interacting with people online. Unless you say completely anodyne, bland comments, you are going to get so much friction and your brain interprets it as if they're on your doorstep, face to face, pushing you in the chest, arguing with you. And th that's how you respond physiologically. And to have an environment where this is your primary form of relating to people and you're never off the clock is what is that going to do to people's decision making? Because one thing that I'm interested in is not, I'm not interested in rebellions, really. I'm not interested in dissenting by itself. I'm interested in how to get closer to a utopian society. And as long as we have systems of communicating with other people that are unnecessarily stressful, and there's a lower level of empathy and compassion in these social communication systems. We, we're not going to make the level of progress that you can. And it's not about reducing social media necessarily. It's about how can we communicate more effectively uh, in a way where you, are no, you, you aren't anonymous. You are able to actually recognize someone's heart and their spirit and their personality. You connect with them there. You can communicate to you can communicate in a way where it's not about wit and speed. It's about can I get your perspective and take that time and I can ponder it and mm -hmm. reflect on it before I have to offer a responsive comment. We don't have remotely systems in place for doing this. Even when you're having meetings at work or faculty meetings for me and in, in the academy, we, we don't allow what I what's what I think it's um, Robert Sternberg's called introverted learners. So they're not introverted. The introverted learner is someone that likes to acquire information in the moment, but information is overwhelming. So you don't often hear their thoughts. They often don't speak publicly or express themselves. They need an incubation period to process that information on their own, reflect on it, and then later will they have an opinion. You need to have meetings and systems. So here's to get the actionable advice where you have a second chance where you can say, hey, does anybody have residual thoughts or comments about our last meeting before you make a decision? What do we do? We make decisions in the first meeting. So the extroverted learners, the assertive people, and the people that don't have the high allostatic load, they're making all the decisions, but are those good qualities to predict that they make superior decisions than introverted learners and people that are stressed. Hmm. I would say that the science says no. Yeah. So can you imagine a social media system that would encourage us to, you know, know each other's hearts and allow time for reflection? Like, could, could you, could you like reverse engineer a new kind of Facebook or Twitter that would do it? Do you know how much money I would make if I could actually do that right here on the fly? I think, I, you know, one thought that I have for if Elon Musk is going to take over Twitter and modify these systems is, can you build in deliberate pauses, especially for people that are younger um, in these in these systems? The idea of for every so you can you can imagine an algorithm and everything will be imperfect so please go nuts on attacking me online after after you hear this podcast um so you can imagine is that you have to have um process by you know process three bits of information from a person before you are allowed to respond when it ends up being um, a morally contentious issue and you could see moral language or emotional language in people's you know in people's communications that happen there it just sets off a trigger so tripwire where where you can't respond right off the bat so you can't speak out of anger immediately and you can't work off of indignation right off the bat you actually have to have time to actually process some of that information so just 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 like gmail gmail now has a system or e these email servers where you can you can ask for an email to be delivered 24 hours from now mm. that it's, it's a built-in tripwire to make sure that you de don't send off that denunciating email to your boss because you hated what they said to you during a meeting there's a way to not only allow that but actually enforce that unless there's a reason to urgently override it 
<laughs> right. Um, I still I still miss you know in person, and now that you know the pandemic has waned at least for a little while. Um, you know, seeing the difference in interaction between you, human beings gathering together. Like I've had groups, we've been meeting on Zoom for two years and we just got together in person. And I think there's, you know, there's something significant about biology and, and olfactory and like just being fully human that I think is, it's often lost in sort of the, you know, the, the techno utopianism um, that, that I often come across. Was there what sort of awkwardness did you experience of or difficulties of like socializing in person and just sitting there in a conversation for such a long period of time? It well, it actually it was kind of a um, a pretty deep retreat. So the awkwardness was kind of an important ingredient in it for so because like people were were very it's very easy to be flippant. Like how you doing? Great. How are you? Right? Is that even a question? Is it just a greeting? Oh, things are fine. Here's like let me let's catch up. But when when there's the, the awkwardness is kind of like you know the the sort of the three bit tripwire. It allowed people, you know, one person started off the conversation by crying and saying, you know, someone dear to her died, and that kind of gave it, it wasn't as, it wasn't easy to escape. Right on Zoom, I can either mentally escape, I can be like down in my email, you don't even know, or I could even, you know, hide my my video and just put up a, a, an avatar and go do something else. But here we were kind of all sitting there with this woman's grief. And it was definitely you know, awkward. And then people came up with their own like depth, right? Which was, it was pain, like everyone was pained in the moment. And it's hard to kind of be open that way and vulnerable. But the outcome was a group of people who felt deep love and allegiance to each other. Yeah, I love I love the way that you describe it is her describing her grief pulls for other people talking about their difficult experiences. And you can imagine, well, we know how often that that analog does not happen translate into the online world because the, the the online world version of that is you express your grief, you get 10,000 likes and comments, but it's not a back and forth exchange of sitting with someone and just offering offering your presence to be there. Like offering a comment is not presence. Um, you have to like look at them, recognize them, see them. Like I can see you and I, you can, and you could see that I'm seeing you, you know, that, you know, all of that perspective taking elements. I mean, that's what you need to not have an unnecessarily contentious conversation or an unnecessary levels of emotional avoidance. Yeah. And I know, you know, in, in the book, there were many, many moments where I felt like, oh, we're friends because you, you like were, were vulnerable about something. And I was forming a relationship with you through it. Like when you're talking about, you know, the stories that you, you know, these, these issues that have been thorns in your side and one way to separate from them is to give them a story name. And like, you know, you talk about the story um, of what is it, the chocolate chip cookie. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, I mean, oh. yeah. Yeah. like I just, you know, like in, in, in the, even in, in, in the words in a book, because there was no like or comment required, I was able to sort of hold. And then I started thinking about what are some of my stories? And, it, you know, it felt like we, you, we had a relationship, even though we didn't. No, we, we did. We did. I mean, that's that's what I think that I think the beauty of books is you get to download a, a great deal, if it's authentic, a great deal of someone's, you know, values, beliefs, and kind of their approach to living, as you described, and then it, it supercharges the relationship. I mean, I think it's that's it's one of the beautiful things about spending two hundred pages um, formulating an idea. Um, you know, one thing that's been very re reinforcing of that particular one is about you know my body dysmorphia. Of I've got all these birthmarks and moles all over my body, and it was a big problem of me taking off my shirt and going to the beach when I was younger. And 
you know, I didn't give all the all the, the gory details of the story of how a 17 year old pointed out to me of how absurd it was, because just look at the skin tags, look at the scars on every person around you. Like there is no body that is does not have, um, you know, blemishes and and asymmetries and mess ups that are on there. And I, I can still remember exactly the moment of that 17 year old, you know, micro mentor that offered me that bit of feedback. Cause I, I, I didn't want to go in a pool party. I think it was in fifth grade that happened there. And you're seeing more conversations that happen um, as a, of, of male body dysmorphia. You know, there's been a lot of, for decades, people have talked about how women are sexualized in the media and kind of the, you know, the, you know, the obsession of, of women having their physical appearance has to be sufficient quality in order to be taken seriously. But that conversation hasn't really dis been discussed about men. And now you have a conversation of men's obsession about muscularity to show a shortcut to showing that they have sufficient masculinity to, pa to pass muster for the social script of, I belong as a man and as a, a powerful and empowered person in the world. And the shortcut is developing muscularity. Mm -hmm. And that leads to a lot of pressure, especially if you're young and you don't have other identities that you're relying on. You don't have a work identity and you don't have a romantic identity and you don't have an identity as a primary caregiver for someone with dependence. In that case, a 15-year-old boy is very vulnerable to overly identifying that if their body is too skinny or too overweight, um, they, they as a human being are fallible and problematic and dysfunctional. And so it's it's nice to get emails from people. It's nice for people to kind of um, reach out about their stories on, the, on these topics because um, I think we do a short shift, sh short shrift for treating the, the, the well-being and the mental health of men. I think we do it for everyone, but I think men and boys are particularly ignored right now in society. So it's always shifting. Right now, it's you know, there's always overcorrections. Right, and you know, and there's there's certainly plenty of of pain to go around. Like, and you know, and so one of the things that was interesting about reading it in a book versus, like, I think there's people who do it well on social media, but I often feel like when I'm being vulnerable on social media, I'm kind of weaponizing it somehow. That it's yeah. that it's either manipulative in some way, or or it's like look at me being so vulnerable. Like there's the, right. It's I think it's it's almost like it's hard not to be performative. Yeah, I mean the best the best advice that I have for people is to really carefully carefully evaluate how you respond to people's. Um, self disclosures and their comments and how people comment on those comments and and you know it, to not turn to social media to find your sense of belonging unless you lack it in your everyday life. I think if if you are fortunate enough to have a close network of individuals where you can gradually disclose important information about yourself reciprocally, um, you know, back and forth to each other don't go to social media to satisfy your need for belonging because it'll it'll unnecessarily detract from it. Now, if you happen to be, you know, in the LGBTQ community and you live in Oklahoma and you can find other people around the world, this is the beauty of social media is you can find your peoples like online. I mean, that that's a, be that's a beautiful thing. And I would say, treat it with care um, as you're describing, right? Reveal something because there's a functional purpose for it and ask yourself if if you're doing it because you want to express that you are this complicated individual or because it's so painful that you can't hold it inside anymore. That's The latter is very different than the performative former mm. in terms of yeah. psychologically satisfying your needs and forming alliances that are going to help you um, reach your human potential and help you, you know, on your missions, whatever those missions are in life. Mm. Beautifully said. Um, I do, I do want to talk about chapter four because um, I think that's the, that's the thing my audience most will benefit from and needs to hear. And the, the, uh, the title is Talk Persuasively. So I can say as having been part of the plant-based slash vegan community for a long time, we can talk so persuasively that we persuade no one and turn off everyone. 
Like, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad you have the self awareness of that. It's great. Oh, I mean, it's you know, it's we. I think many of us have the self awareness. We just blame other people for it. Like, if I just had a bigger megaphone or you know more fake blood to throw at the the fur wearers or, or whatever, and I just you know the. I, I wrote to I, I do some um, some writing for for a blog that's very sort of you know food ethical and sustainable food for all and I realized oh they're doing all the things that you talk about so I would love to just talk about the the principles and the fir the first one I love you know, the phrase you say you know be an insider not a sidewalk preacher yeah I mean. This, I mean, you know, as you're saying that, I'm thinking about um, growing up in the '80s with PETA, and they're, you know, they, they would they liked to shock people by, you know, by blowing up laboratories, and as you're saying, going to a, a Paris um, fashion festival and throwing the fake blood on people who are who were wearing fur coats, and they got a lot of attention. And as you described, no, you know, very few people were like, "Oh, that's an organization that I want to spend, you know, I'm going to donate money to." I mean you're already at the fashion festival. So what do you need my money for? I mean, let me go fund some, you know, some orphans who live in Romania over, over PETA. Um, the idea of attention and eyeballs is, is a proxy for persuading and adding to your coalition. Mm -hmm. um, and as you're saying, like, it's not the case at all. I mean, so the idea of be not being a sidewalk preacher is we want to, when we, when we are in the minority and, and, and your community is, is a minority is, is you know is believing uh you know that meat is problematic in terms of consumption of how we consume it and we should eat more ethically and think about what you know who are the suppliers and producers of our food and, and actually spend time kind of pondering and being mindful about this um you don't want to preach that everyone's in the wrong you don't want to be threatening to other people's identities and as we've been talking about you know we, who suffers the most is marginalized individuals who are on food stamps and they have such a small amount of money and what's the most expensive food ethical um you know highly advanced food that kind of makes sure is that we're going to use safe careful techniques to kind of to, in terms of curate curating edible products um healthy food has always been more expensive than unhealthy food so that's not going to be that's not an effective way to strategize that's a street worker approach the to be an insider is for you to actually think about it from the perspective of how e what is the ease the ease of following the message and that is financial psychological time effort energy and that's how we have to be thinking about messaging and if you if you make it complicated in terms of finances you're going to lose people even people that have money because mm -hmm. um, then it's going to be about status as opposed to they care about the cause um, this is what happened with electric cars is electric cars have been so expensive is that people buy them not because they care about the environment but because basically they're signaling is that they're the type of person that cares about the environment and that's that's not an effective way to move a society from gas guzzling engines to electrically powered engines right yeah it turn, you know it turns out that beyond burgers are a better uh, you know advocate for plant-based eating than you know nobel laureates could not have said it better right because the ease is how do i get how do i get my hands around really amazing enjoyable food and that's that's ease i mean that's you you want to go that route if, if you make it sound like it's going to be it looks like bacon it feels like bacon but it doesn't taste like bacon and it's more expensive than bacon well you just lost a ton of people now if you have a taste test about that it's that it's actually better because you don't feel the fattiness which all of my kids can't stand and the other can i is someone who's health conscious now you're moving in the right direction for for persuading people of you understand that you people want food that tastes good right. um so how so how do, well, how do we think about emphasizing commonalities you know a lot a lot of people i know who are the most passionate i, I would they call themselves abolitionists and and they're doing it consciously evoking that they're fighting against slavery and if you're you know a person fighting against slavery in the 19th century first half of the 19th century america like you weren't talking about well let's make 
slavery better or more humane or let's change the economics. It was just like this, this categorical, we are fighting against evil. And I don't see that message, you know, I, I see that message working in certain places to take people maybe who are in the tent, but like right to the center pole. But how, how do you help people who, who honestly see, you know, a holocaust of animals um, to, to, to talk about things like ease and, and convenience and cost and, and, stay tr and stay true to themselves? Well, one thing is, I think, just building off of what you said, anytime you make the argument between good versus evil, it's a, it's a simplistic argument. It's easy to sell. But that means that those people that you're looking for as future adherents and advocates of your cause, right now they're evil. And so you are demoralizing and you are dehumanizing their approach to living now. So right off the bat, you've got people and their defenses are up. They view it as a threat. And as you mentioned, you know, in chapter two, talking about status quo bias, one of the things that makes us pull for the status quo and not lean towards the benefits of changing is believing that it is threatening to our identity to try to change that way. So we have to have some, the whole metaphor of, of a Holocaust and slavery evokes such strong imagery because basically you're saying that people are pro-slavery who are on the other side. So you are you are immediately alienating them. And so you have to figure out what is the way that you can validate people's approach where it's forgiveness, reconciliation, and a sense of understanding of, of course you would have eaten meat your entire life because you've been bombarded with this many commercials over this many years of your life. And who's been spending the most money on commercials? It's been McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's. And so we understand that you've been culturally programmed your entire life. What we want to say is it's not the only way. And so in this way, you're, the enemy is a common enemy. And that is this capitalistic enterprise that has altered, altered people's minds over the course of their lifetime, which is true. And so if you do it this way, it's a way where you can you can you can grasp their life life history, and they don't have to look at look at their prior chapters as some moral failings, but as this led me to now, where now I have the wherewithal to make a stronger and a better moral decision, and that that kind of approach is going to work better than going for the you know the Star Wars, Luke Skywalker versus Darth Vader approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and at the same time though, I'm I'm thinking about I think it was P. T. Barnum. No, it was somebody else. It was uh, um, someone whom I remember saying it's e it's easier to fool someone than to convince them that they've been fooled. Right. So, so, so no, even even yeah. saying you've been programmed, like I, I, people bristle at that. Like, no, I'm not. I'm making my own choices. We've always eaten meat. So, um, so. Pr I'm glad, Howie, thank you for pushing back. The key element of that was not the brainwashing part. The key element is if you can provide, break it down into a very, so my friend Carla Starr wrote a book, wrote a book called Making Numbers Count. And she talks about, you need to have a provocative metaphor of the numbers of just how many commercials that the average 30 year old, 40 year old has seen over their lifetime. And when you can break it down to the percentage of their lives, that they have spent attending to these commercials. Now all of a sudden it's like it comes it comes to life. And you're not trying to sell this, whether there's a conspiracy or not, of people trying to manipulate people. You're saying your physical vision has been exposed to this much this much information over the course of your lifetime. That's what that's the part that will convey people. So mm. and that fits with another principle, which is one of the ways to, as a minority in terms of you're trying to alter the status quo is as much as possible focus on objective information as opposed to subjective tastes. And that's objectively you and I in our lifetime have been exposed to a lot of commercials and it's not in the past five years because a lot of us have cut the cord on our cable, but those early years of being sitting in front of a TV, um, they really altered our tastes. Now focus less on the mind control, excuse what I said before and focus more on, can we turn it into very compelling numbers of um, six years of your life? For, I'm just making this number up. Mm -hmm.
have been spent watching commercials. And these are the commercials that were the most popular during the 80s and the 90s. Mm, I love that. Because that's, that's, that's actually not just objective and convincing. It's also interesting. Right. We're, we're having right. a different conversation in which my brain goes, oh, wow, that's that's something like juicy to chew on. That's like that's like pleasure in this conversation now. Yeah. Yeah. So we're moving away from the threat to curiosity. And so now what does curiosity lead to? It is the des- the motivation to seek out new information and experiences in the pursuit of learning and self growth. And so we want we want to activate that state. So if you give closure. And you just say, uh, you know, you've been messed up by society and you've been making the, the wrong moral decisions. There's no conversation. There's, that's, that's, a, that's a closed end conversation. But if you keep the loop open by saying, just think about this. How has your identity been shaped knowing that this number of years of your life you've been watching commercials? And you could think of then you then, you know, then you, Howie and I and everyone else listening can say, what was I watching as commercials that like infiltrated? I mean, I mean, I know, for example, is that there were so many commercials from Toys R Us and KB Toy Store. And I always liked sports over toys. But man, was I pushed to buy toys uh-huh. um, all the time. I'd like, you know, for Christmas and for Hanukkah, it was it was you want toys under that tree. Well, what was the big deal about toys? There were no commercials for books. There were no commercials for, you know, that much for sports equipment because sports equipment was cheap. So that wasn't something that was kind of, you know, and there was, there was no change in a glove of a baseball glove. And so companies didn't spend money on that. So what was, what was it they were pulling? GI Joe figures, transformers, go bots, um, whatever is the new latest thing, just keep on buying stuff. And so, like you said, there's an endless conversation about, you know, what has my brain been sucked into and where I, I lost free will for a good number of years. Right. And I'm just, you know, as we're having this conversation, I'm thinking about, all of the um, fast food ditties that I can remember, like I can I can give you the, the the Big Mac formula, like you know, wake me up at two in the morning, I can do two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onion, and sesame seed bun, or or <laughs> have it your way at Burger King. Like now, like this is actually a fun conversation, and it's and and at the same time, it's sowing the seeds for me later in the comfort of my own mind to say, gee, I wonder if there's something there. So it's, it's almost like playing the long game rather than saying like, this conversation has to end with your conversion. Right, uh, by the way, your memory is fantastic compared to mine, I'm so jealous. Um, <laughs> well, I'm, th- I'm, that's I'm what, 10 that's years one of, older, yeah. I have 10 more years of McDonald's commercials. <laughs> no, 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 still, no, no, it's, it's just, it's impressive. <laughs> um, you hit one of the other principles, which is the, w- when the majority tries to influence. So you think of like a Putin, think of a Biden, think of a Trump, right? Think of like whoever's, you know, the CEO or the manager of the of the company that you work with. They they can use their power to demand that you follow the suit with them. So they can get compliance. They can just say, listen, you know what? Everyone's going to work Wednesdays. We're now going to work nine o'clock because that's when our clients tend to be there. Um, you don't have much say. Now you might not have converted your views to that, but you're definitely going to behave in a way that shows compliance because you want to keep your job. Now, the minority influence is a little bit different. If you don't have the numbers, the status, the power, or you're a marginalized group, when you're trying to influence people, you can't wield around power and force people. So one of the strategies is that it's always a long game with minority influence. And today's social activists don't understand this and don't appreciate this sufficiently, is that you, you can't change people by just forcing forcing them off of the communication medium, forcing forcing them not to have conversations, forcing a publisher to say their book's not going to be published. As long as they exist and you make something, it's just book banning, conversation banning just makes things more seductive and persuasive. The strategy is to point out the frailties and the problems in that approach and realize that it's exactly what you said. You will not do not expect conversion right off the bat. Sow the seeds. We call it the sleeper effect in science is that you often see small alterations in behavior, not the thing that you were trying to change, but something adjacent. So as an example, the research shows that if you try to change people's views on abortion, it's very difficult because people have very strong views 
and they're very certain about their positions. But often if, if, you, if, if people tell their stories face-to-face -face about the personal harm they experienced, either way you want to change on the abortion debate to get people to realize that women should have more opportunities to actually be in charge of their bodies and have access to medical care, or you want to kind of ban all of these practices from, you know, that women don't have access to any of this legally. Whichever approach you're going, um, it's when you hear these personal stories, people won't flip their views. But what you might get is that people actually re recognize that women should have more rights elsewhere. And how come we're de how come we're designing transparent staircases because they look aesthetically appealing in law firms and in you know large skyscrapers? Because if you wear a skirt. And you have a transparent staircase, what happens when you're on a lower level and a woman's on a higher level that happens there? Who tends to be architects? They tend to be men. And so they're not thinking from the perspective of women. So they might change their view over there, an adjacent place about women's rights. And then maybe later, they kind of shift slightly in terms of their views about abortion. It's just a, an example, but it's the idea of you might not get the change you want, but you might... You'd be surprised how you can shift people's views on adjacent topics and adjacent issues. So don't give up quickly, but also don't expect immediate results. Mm -hmm. Well, it's almost like you're you're asking people to prioritize human connection over their issue or as like it's not just a means, but like there's something beautiful. There's something beautiful about not having the power to eat it, to issue fiats. Right. Like it's almost like that constraint means that when change comes, it's real. It's not just Biden able to say, OK, masks today. And then he, you know, the Supreme, you know, then the, the judge in Florida says, no, I'm throwing that out. And then people take off their masks in mid-flight because he, he had no moral suasion over that. It's almost like the fact that we don't have power is like a plus in some ways. Right, which leads to another strategy that's effective as a minor for a minority influence, which is don't be humble about showing the personal sacrifices that you're making by 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 giving a message and expressing it publicly. And I think a lot of people make this mistake of of not pointing out how many hours they put in for investigative journalism to understand that this meatpacking company that's making poultry for for citizens all over the world how they're mistreating chickens well how many hours did you spend how many what did you miss in terms of your kids sports and your kids you know cello practice and their concerts because you you were sitting outside doing a sting operation outside to actually you know observe and do surveillance on that meat packing company well make that clear and that shows that you have skin in the game and it shows that you're not just someone that's kind of like a fanatical extremist about meeting is that you're someone that cares about this and you are making personal sacrifices for this mission um, that makes you a compelling character. And it's like you said, because you lack the power and because you have to make those sacrifices and you don't have the money to hire an au pair to watch your kids while you're doing this um, and you're, you're taking a hit on your paycheck to pay for babysitters, is that says, oh, I should listen to you. Like, I'm, It's like you took on a third job because you care so much about this issue. You are worthy of of my attention and you've gained my receptive audience. Yeah, and that helped me understand. So, you know, I, I partner with, um, I help out the Food Revolution Network, which was started by John Robbins, who is the heir to the Baskin Robbins fortune. And he walked away from it in his 20s and, you know, became a hippie essentially and moved to a little island. And that became, that they keep telling that story in, in their, their branding and messaging and maybe sort of understand like the power of the story isn't just, oh, that's interesting or cool, but it's really about like signaling, like this guy sacrificed everything. He, you know, he grew up with an ice cream cone shaped swimming pool in his backyard. And, and here he is trying to grow his own kale from seed on an island off of British Columbia. Wait, is that true that, that the owner of Baskin Robbins had an ice cream shaped yes. swimming pool? Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to look. I want to see. I want to see a picture of what I it can, looks like. That's yeah. I can, there's there's an aerial there's an aerial <laughs> photo. So. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. I think I. You know. I mean. Just again, we have to have the self awareness to see what are what's what autobiographical stories and biographical stories um, are most attract are we most attracted to? And we love we love the 
you know, the first immigrant story and we love the first generation college student and we love the entrepreneur that had dyslexia and couldn't graduate high school. Like we love these stories we, and these and these stories, what do they have in common? They have, you know, failings and they have errors and they have, you know, false negatives that in those stories where these were people that were misidentified as someone didn't have high quality potential and they ended up being successful. And so if we deconstruct what stories work for mm -hmm. us, we can use those same tactics to improve the way that we do storytelling. Yeah. So the, 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 the line that I bolded the most in the book, um, I'll give you the sentence, the two sentences before it, and then the bold one. Um, this is about, be, you know, spark curiosity, not fear. And I love that, you know, you have then have a story of Semmelweis, which I have always read in context as here's a hero, here's someone to be like, and you're saying like, here was this hero who could, who was ineffective because he didn't follow these principles. It was kind of a, you know, he's a cautionary tale, which I loved. And then, and then you write as a principled insubordinate, adopt a conciliatory and friendly tone. Don't shame, blame, or maim status quo enthusiasts. Love the poetry. And then here's a line, view exponents of orthodoxy as your future allies. And that just blew me away to, like, to go through the practice of seeing these people who, you know, I just want them to go away. I want to hurt them. I want to make them suffer. I want them to see what they've done to say, no, these are your future allies. Because of course they have to be, and I just I thought that was like such a crux of of the book and of the message. Thank you. I'm I'm, I'm taken aback because it's cool. It's cool hearing my writing um, separated from the rest of the work that happens there. Um, you know, I I can think of instances on both political extremes that where they show there's so many problems on both extremes right now of this. I think of. Um, you know, James Lindsay fighting critical race theory. And I could think of, you know, the insurrection on January 6th, you know, last year in terms of uh, on the Capitol. And in both of these cases, um, you, you have, you have this required Steven Spielberg storyline of, you know, we, we are fighting evil and we are the righteous knights that are coming to save society. And, and there's, there's, there's no thought that's been expressed publicly by either one of those contingents um, and these are both at the political margins of both groups that the other group is they are valued. They are, they are, um, they have strengths, they have capabilities, um, and they are people that, you know, that I, I want to be around. And I respect the fact that they have values that they're willing to actually sacrifice for and devote their lives around. And, and I want to be around intelligent people, even if they don't agree with me, there's, there's not, there's none of that conciliatory tone and, we're going to live in we're going to live in a society with people who have an appeal towards leaders that we abhor so trump is the the latest example but he's not the he's not the first and he's not going to be the last one and one of the things i've been fighting at george mason university my own home turf is where else would we want these students who are pro trump to go than to come to a university and be there and there was it was such a strong message that we are we abhor anyone that supports trump and i view it of you want them you want education you want them to be in a classroom where they're having constructive debates and they're listening to the other side and there's there is there's a set of principles in terms of you don't talk the entire time and you're going to hear what other people have to say and you have to allow criticism and think about the flaws in your arguments where else would you want them to go i don't want them to be radicalized and you know end up um, you know having stronger more extreme beliefs i want them to think about how they how they figure out what questions need to be considered in society what are the problems in society that are worth fighting for and then what solutions thinking flexibly are available, including my first, second, third, 10th, 20th possibilities in terms of pathways for getting towards these solutions that are going there. So I want them to come to schools. And if you're, and if you're on the other end and you're pushing, you know, and you're fighting against critical race theory and you're, you're, you're pushing, you're pushing against diversity. Well, you have to ask yourself, what do you want to do with people who have been marginalized their entire lives? Like, where are they going? Where are they? Where do they go in your model where you're fighting against diversity? And when you're, if you're pushing strong for diversity, where do the older white men go? 
because there's not really a discussion of where their place is. And it can't just be is your, your time is mm -hmm. up. We're not going to listen to you anymore. Your wisdom is null and void. That's not the way that a social mission functionally enters society, gets its tendrils in, and actually works in the long run. Well, and you had a chapter that I kind of was uncomfortable with, which was like, what, if, what, what, what happens when we win? And then we become the assholes we've been fighting against. And it's it was it, it's it's rankled a lot of people that chapter. It was it was it was On beautiful, purpose. and it was like well, I don't want to think about that, right? Like let's let's think about that when we get there. But then of course it's too late because the means we've used to get there has already marginalized and dehumanized. Yeah, it's and it's and and the thing about it, and we know this from you know Al, Elliot Aronson's work, you know, from the seventies, and you know a lot of his colleagues is there when we move from love to hate, of these people are our friends, and then we take on a cause, and then all of a sudden they become the bad guys and gals. That hate, that loathing, is so strong. And it's so memorable that it's very hard to reverse that once that occurs. And the other way, when you go from hate to love, it's the love is so powerful because you know it's earned and you know that that someone has changed their view about you. And it's as, some of the strongest relationships come from prior adversaries and nemeses of realizing of like, listen, you know what? I was I was wrong about how I thought about you before. I apologize sincerely. And this is all done privately, not not publicly. That happens some of the strongest relationship. Nelson Mandela has so many stories in his autobiography about um, the you know previous white nationalists that became some of his closest friends and allies and people that he would go to when he was kind of trying to you know leading Africa. And there's there's so many models in there about you know the the reconciliation that was made in Africa and and how nemeses became friends. That we have to. You're right. We have to be thinking about this long before we win because. We have to constantly remember this precept. Love to hate is really hard to reverse. Hate to love is some of the strongest love that ever exists. Mm. I don't know if you, if, if you watch the uh, HBO series Euphoria, if you've seen any of that. Mm. There's, a, there's a scene um, where the sponsor is talking to his AA protege saying basically, you know, she's talking about like she can't forgive herself for things she's done. And that's why she drinks and he's saying, like, we live in a society in which we're not supposed to forgive anybody else. Like people have people he says like if and if we live that way, if we create a society where people are irredeemable, then nobody's going to want to be redeemed. And I don't want to live in that world. It's a good word. Yeah. I should start. I'm going to start using that more often. It's and, and the. And this allows you to understand, doesn't mean you have to agree. It makes you understand why people choose paths that are contrary to your own. If, if you, right, if, if you don't, if you cannot give an olive branch to people, why would I spend my limited scarce time on this earth engaging with you? And then as you continue complaining that there hasn't been a sufficient apology, they haven't made amends, you would expect them to kind of, you know, reverse their wrongdoings in the past. Why? Because there's there's no path for them to have anything other than negativity. And we have to have some openings available. And it's it's a tough conversation. And I, and I don't see a sufficient number of those conversations. Yeah. And what I'm suddenly realizing is that at least in the plant-based movement and the vegan movement, the, the strength and courage required isn't the courage to throw paint or stand up or yell at, at meat eaters. The courage is to show restraint and compassion and love because of the opprobrium you're going to achieve, you're going to receive from your own community for being disloyal. Wow. I love that. It's great. That should be the trailer for this entire episode. <laughs> uh, I'll, go, I'll go look at the time. One minute, th hour 13, 53. I'll go find it. Um, wow, we, we've been talking a long time, and I, I want to be conscious of your time. You agreed to an hour, and it's, it's flown by for me. This has been so much fun. No, I mean – how it, I mean, what I love is I love that we're talking of a, a value framework that you hold deeply that is not one of my missions. And it's 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 really useful to talk about these concepts and the science in a very concrete way. So mm -hmm. using, you know, 
kind of this plant-based ethical eating system as a as a as a way to kind of really bring this this content to life is is really fun for me because I haven't done this before. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. So the, let's let's make sure people get the book, The Art of Insubordination: How to Dissent and Defy Effectively. Um, absolutely, everyone who cares about the world should get it because it's just gonna it's just so practical. It's just gonna give you tools and and words to use that are just going to like cut cut like you know hot knife through um vegan butter uh, <laughs> and, and where, where can people you know you've written a whole bunch of other books that we haven't talked about and you're you're clearly you know engaged in ongoing research where can people kind of follow your career and, and your thoughts uh, i mean um i just i just i just opened a, a Substack newsletter this week and uh you can find everything off my website toddcashin.com okay great uh, is it a uh, a free or a paid sub stack free yeah I, i'm re- I, I mean my my mission right now at this point in my career is educate the public about science is i mean i published a lot of scientific articles still still write pieces but i really want to get the science to the people i mean i want that's that's so why would I charge people for that? Awesome. So I will I will go find that. I'll put a link in the show notes. And such a pleasure to meet you. And and oh, same here. So th- thank you so much for taking the time and for for all the work you do. I appreciate it. And thanks for the kind kind words about the book. Um, you know, it's a very lonely endeavor trying to put one of these babies together. Mm. And I'll say, I'll say one other thing, which is we didn't talk about it at all. But The Matrix is one of the most fucking useful things I have ever read. And it's already changed my coaching practice. Like I've, I said, I, this is so, and so I'm not, we're not even going to like tease it for people, but just the matrix that you have, the, the four quadrants, like has, has made me much more powerful in how I help people decide what they want to do and then go about doing it. Oh, I appreciate that. I mean, it's it's building off the shoulders of a lot of great scientists that are all in the end notes. Yep, and that's uh, and you're and you're very you know upfront about the, um, you know where you get your material, and you know it's part of the the process of like being objective, saying like here's what it doesn't it doesn't weaken you to say here's all the great people I got this from, right? It actually strengthens you and your credibility. So it's a great modeling. Yeah. I- I mean, if anything, I mean, you know, we should be skeptical of people who say that they created a, a new uniform theory of physics and it's not based on anything that anyone has done before. I mean, you, you look look for the strands of wise men and women that people built their ideas on is something that I, I tell my students all the time. Beautiful. So a lot, a lot of my ideas come from Todd Cashton. So uh, I, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate getting to know you a little bit and I uh, hope we can continue to have conversations because this has been really eye-opening and fun. Appreciate it. Thank you. Same. Be well. <laughs>